Yeah, but every movie has that. Even the third one with the Last Crusade, he's banging the uh, the, the Nazi. Don't give oh, it away. Spoiler. That's a big Sorry. I've never seen it. Thanks a lot, oh, Big D. That's no, a I'm huge s- part of the fuck. whole movie. I'm sorry. I, I, I... Remember when we first met John McClane? Argyle picked him up from the plane and took him down to Nakatomi Tower at the Christmas party. And the terrorists were overzealous, but it was sweet when they killed Ellis. And with a little help from Alan, John McClane came. Welcome back to Shat the Movies, the podcast where we answer the question, were the movies we loved when we were growing up really that good? Have you ever caught yourself thinking, why don't they make movies like they used to? Can you still remember spending your Friday night searching for the perfect movie rental at Blockbuster Video? Do you know what Blockbuster Video is? If you answered yes, and this is the podcast for you, I am one of your hosts, Gene Lyons, and alongside me are my co-hosts, Ash Kalima Schlafly. Hi, y'all. And Big D Dick Ebert. Good evening. And each week, we take a look back in time and decide if our favorite films still hold up. The movies we cover are chosen by you, the listeners, who generously commission the films you love. If you'd like to see all the movies we have covered, will cover, or want to choose one for yourself, please visit shatthemovies.com and have a look. And at the end of each podcast, we'll provide you, the audience, with the number of wipes each movie would take to get off your respective butts. So thank you so much for listening. If you have not already, hit that subscribe button and share with a friend. It's how we help the podcast grow. Additionally, please subscribe to our sister podcast, Chat on TV, where we review TV series such as Westworld, Taboo, American Gods, Game of Thrones, True Detective, Watchmen, and we are just wrapping up Lovecraft Country from HBO. You can find all that information or past episodes at ShatOnTV.com. And finally, if you'd like to hang out with us live all week long, you can follow and subscribe to our Twitch channel at ShatTheMovies.com slash Twitch. We play video games host watch parties, and end each week with a shappy hour cocktail party on Friday. And even if you don't watch Twitch, even if you don't like watching people game, even if you don't want to interact with us, you can subscribe using your Amazon Prime membership, and that does help contribute to the podcast without costing you anything. All that being said, Big D, what movie are we reviewing today? So Gene, one of the things that I'm the most proud of with this podcast is that We have listeners, I don't know how it happened, outside of the United States. So in some way, we are a representative of our country to the world. So today's commission comes from one of our listeners who is international, George P. And he is English, who grew up in France, but now lives in Brazil. So he covers most of the countries that we are uh, popular in. So we appreciate having George P. on board, all of our international listeners Uh, It is very flattering to find out that we're ranking in iTunes of nations around the world. It is wonderful. And George P. said, I would love for you guys to do the iconic, the wonderful, the loved Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. I bet this guy fucks. Like, George fucks, man. Oh, God, yes. Of course. Fuck it. Wait, what was it again? He's English? He's English. Lived in France. Lived in France and then went to Brazil? Yep, He's been in Brazil since uh, 2013. This dude doesn't even have the top three buttons on his shirt. Oh. Like he just cruises around like that. What's up? It's me, George. He's probably George. He's George. <laughs> even though in the letter he talks about Brazilian sex motels. So I think you're right on the money. <laughs> well, George writes, Dear Shot the Movies, I hope you all are keeping well and staying healthy. I've been wanting to commission a film from you guys for a while now, but for one reason or another, never quite got around to it. Over the past couple of weeks, however, as people around the world have been forced into quarantine by the coronavirus, I've realized how much I truly appreciate the work that you and other podcasters do. And it was about time I gave something back to shut the movies. Hearing one of Gene's famous humble brags or a story about Roger's teenage sex exploits or some much appreciated words of wisdom from Big D offer some very welcome relief in an otherwise uncertain time. So thank you very much for agreeing to share your thoughts on one of my all-time favorite movies, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. I'm English, but grew up in France. In an effort to keep us connected with our English roots and the English language, our aunt used to send us VHS tapes she'd recorded off of English television. When I was about eight, a tape arrived with Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom written on the side, and I was blown away. I must have watched it every Saturday and Sunday morning before the rest of my family woke up for about six months. 
I realize that the film hasn't aged particularly well, and there are undoubtedly certain elements that would be considered problematic. It's fairly racist throughout, definitely has a white savior narrative, and even has some sexism thrown in for good measure. It's also a lot darker than I remember it. Child slavery and famine and the beating heart scene come to mind. Despite all of this, I still think it's a great adventure movie with some unforgettable scenes, and I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts. Thanks again, and take care, everyone. George. P.S. I've lived in Brazil since 2013 and can confirm that people do indeed put used toilet paper in small bins next to the toilet, and everything Big D and his wife said about motels is true. They are great fun. Can you imagine if George sounds like Joe T, who commissioned... (laughs) Victory. Mm-hmm. It would be like Harrison Ford, like a young Harrison Ford, sweaty, uh, standing in the temple. I would be all about him. Yeah, we're putting together like a Justice League of <laughs> listeners. Like if we just get an all star <laughs> cast of all the listeners, Flavor Dave, you get George in there, you get Joe, we can just retire. And in fact, I feel like I, I, I can just step out on this podcast because George covered all the points about racism and sexism and a white savior uh, complex. I'm, I'm done. Thanks, George. I'm just going to sit back and watch you guys enjoy my cocktail. But for those who don't know, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom is a 1984 action adventure film directed by Steven Spielberg. It is the second installment in the Indiana Jones franchise, a prequel to the 1981 film Raiders of the Lost Ark, featuring Harrison Ford reprising his role as the title character. And it is the second film ever to use THX technology after Return of the Jedi. In this movie, after arriving in India, Indiana Jones is asked by desperate villagers to find a mystical stone and rescue their children from a cult practicing child slavery, black magic, and ritualistic human sacrifice in honor of the goddess Kali. Lawrence Kasdan, Lucas's collaborator on Raiders of the Lost Ark, turned down the offer to write the script, and Willard Huck and Gloria Katz were hired as his replacements, who had previously worked with Lucas on American Graffiti. The film was released a financial success, but initial reviews were mixed, criticizing its darker elements and violence. It was nominated for the Academy Award for Best Original Score and won the Academy Award for Best Visual Effects. A sequel, Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade, followed in 1989. So guys, I've mentioned before that I'd never seen Temple of Doom, but I loved Raiders of the Lost Ark. Big D, what are your memories of this movie? So it seems like many of the weeks I say, oh, I don't remember where I was. I don't remember the first time I saw it. That is not the case for this movie. I could tell you when this came out in May of 84, I was 10. My friend Vinny Wallace and I, we convinced my mother to drive us to the late show on Friday night at the closest theater that was showing it. It was like 20 minutes away. So it was an endeavor to get my mom to take us. So we are so excited. We're in a sold out packed theater fired up to see the sequel or the prequel to Indiana Jones, the movie's going, I'm excited, we're watching, and then as they go into the river, the projector gets jammed. No! The the film melts. We all looked around like, is this some part of the movie? Is this... (laughs) They spent about three or four minutes trying to fix it. It was the only print they had. They gave us vouchers for another movie, (laughs) and we were forced to leave. This this is the moment of disappointment, true and utter disappointment is etched in my psyche. I can remember what it felt like to walk out. And it took like another two weeks to get my mother to take us back there. So the first time I saw this was a shit show, but it taught me a lesson. This explains your review of Detroit Rock City. You're just you're scarred by the fact that you went to a show. It didn't go the way you wanted. Your tickets were invalidated (laughs) and you were heartbroken. You need to get therapy, Big D. Like you got to get to fix this. Ash, how about you? Well, I was only one when this came out, so I don't remember seeing this in theaters, but I think I've shared before, my family pretty much went to the movies every weekend. And one of the first movies I remember seeing in the theater was Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade when I was six years old. And so to prepare for that, my family watched all of the other Indiana Jones before that movie came out. And I remember the first time I saw this, like yesterday, I was obsessed with everything Indiana Jones, the entire 
trilogy uh, from pretty much the get-go. I love Raiders. I love Last Crusade, but I am one of those rare people that Temple of Doom has always been my favorite of the three. Uh, I know that it's kind of the black sheep. I know Steven Spielberg calls it the black sheep of the trilogy, and maybe it is, but there's something about this movie that I've always really, really enjoyed. And so I could not have been more excited when I saw on the schedule that we were doing this, especially following a movie like Maximum Overdrive last week, like jumping back into the action adventure, which is one of my favorite genres. I was pretty excited. And I have to say, I I, I still really really love this movie. And I got to watch it with my son prepping for the pod, which was really cool. Getting to kind of, he'd never even heard of Indiana Jones. And now, you know, he wants a hat and apparently he still holds up for little boys in 2020, which I think is kind of neat. Well, we've got lots to talk about on this podcast. So Big D, roll that trailer. adventure has a name. It must be Indiana Jones. From Steven Spielberg and George Lucas. Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Don't believe me. You will, Dr. Joe. In 1935, Indiana Jones narrowly escapes the clutches of Lao Che, a crime boss in Shanghai who met Jones to exchange a diamond for the ashes of Emperor Nurachi. With his sidekick short round and the nightclub singer Willie Scott in tow, Indy flees Shanghai on a cargo aircraft that, unbeknownst to them, is owned by Lao Che. While the three of them are asleep on the airplane, the pilots dump the fuel and exit by parachute. Indy, Shorty, and Willie discover the sabotage and narrowly manage to escape just before the plane crashes into the mountainside. So I'm going to prepare everybody. I think my review of this movie is going to be much like Gene doing anything that covers teenage angst (laughs) or, uh, you know, really not fitting in and being on the outside of high school. I will gush over this movie. When it starts out, we get that genuine Hollywood look and feel, the musical act. It's, It's theatrical. It's over the top. It's campy. But it does feel like the Maltese Falcon. It feels like a throwback to old Hollywood. When they're kicking the diamond around the floor and the showgirls are going and it's just it's just chaos, balloons on the floor. Normally, I would be just fuming. I'd be like, this is ridiculous. But I found myself really enjoying it. And I thought it was a good ode to the old day of the action movies from Hollywood. You call it an ode to the old day of action movies, but I I see it like this self-indulgent, like, jerk fest right this was a garbage ass opening big d i think about raiders where it's like it's indiana jones he's in the jungle now we're going into like this temple he's got to retrieve a thing there's a boulder going after me like yeah let's go we got right to it i would be so furious if i was big d as a child and maybe it's because you didn't get to this part (laughs) like we did like i'm sitting down in the theater and i'm like all right indiana jones what's he gonna do next what adventure is he on and they're like anything goes like fuck this you clearly don't appreciate a good tap number because it was absolutely (laughs) fantastic and when they go from like the big fan and they go to like the full-on hollywood like i was the only thing i'm bummed out by is that they didn't jump in a pool because like it's that big (laughs) tribute to you know the 1920s and 30s movie musical where they always just seem to be in a pool doing synchronized swimming at some point after they tap dance so maybe i'll give a little bit of a an extra wipe for that lost opportunity but i thought it was brilliant and you're talking about kids finn is watching it and he goes wow how did all of their red things turn into one red thing when she runs back out he thought it was a total magic trick so i think it's awesome but ash that's not a kid that's your kid it's very different 
I don't know. I don't. I mean, as as a kid, I, I mean, sure, maybe, maybe it's biased because I also loved this as a kid. But I, I think Kate Capshaw. This is one of the best parts of the movie for her. But what I do think is interesting is the dress she's wearing in this scene was like a one of a kind dress from the 1930s. It was a Parisian dress. It cost an exorbitant amount of money, and so she had a whole dance number that she was supposed to do alongside the extra tap dancers, and she couldn't move in the dress because it was so tight. So they didn't have time. So they just cut her whole dance number that she'd spent months learning, which is why she just sings in Mandarin, anything goes. So I really think that you're holding her accountable for something that wasn't her fault. And maybe that would have been better. But I thought it was a badass opening, not a garbage ass opening. Wait, wait, you, th- you think you think Gene wanted a bigger opening number? Is That's that a blessing. You- <laughs> it's a blessing. <laughs> Well, so we t- I talked about Kate Capshaw a second, and let's get the sexy man elephant out of the room and go ahead mm-hmm. and talk about it. Because I have drooled over a lot of men on this podcast, from Christian Slater to Lou Diamond Phillips to Kiefer Sutherland, but none of them... They all look like tiny little boys compared to Harrison Ford in this movie. He walks in with that white tuxedo jacket and those black pants, and he is a man. And he is beautiful and gorgeous and... I still, like, young Harrison Ford, I think is one of the most sexy things that has ever walked the face of this planet. Uh, Okay, so I'm confident saying this. He he is man candy in this movie. Mm -hmm. He is lean. He's toned. He's confident. But Gene and I touched on this on Raiders of the Lost Ark way back a couple years ago. I think Dr. Jones is a man of questionable moral character. We hear so many times throughout the entire franchise that he does things that are a little bit off. In Raiders, he had sex with Marion as a 15-year-old student of his. So we know boundaries don't always matter to him, right? Here, he willingly takes an innocent singer as a human shield and holds her at knife point. His old friend gets shot and killed. He never mentions it, doesn't act sad. There's no remorse. Indy might not be such a good guy. First of all, the dude's name was Wuhan. So you know that he was bad news anyway. Keep him the (laughs) fuck away from you. But also, like, that's part of his appeal. Like, if you look at these, you know, Big D, you were saying old Hollywood, these classic hard-boiled detectives in these noir films, that's how they acted, you know? The Sam Spades of the world, like, that's how they acted. It was like a, sorry, Dame, like, gotta run, you know? That that was their that was their shtick. And so I actually like that indie. I like the indie from the Raiders Lost Ark. Not this, like, fucking caricature of a character that we get in this movie. Okay, I got you. So now I'm more okay with the fact that he then turns around and punches one of the female waitresses right in the mouth. Yeah, I- I'm okay. I like that. I'm I'm now okay with the fact that he takes an orphan child off the street and involves him in a gunfight in the middle of Shanghai <laughs> and then encourages him to drive a getaway car, almost killing dozens of other innocent people on the street. Oh, you mean the orphan child that tried to fucking pick his pocket, Big D? He is helping this child along. He could have... Listen, you're a white man in China in the 30s and some little Chinese kid in an opium den tries to steal your wallet. You could probably just kill him and nobody would even care. But but no, Indy's like, you know what? I'm going to take short round under my wing and you know I'm going to raise him as my own. I think that's a very charitable cause, my friend. Short round might have been his wingman. You might be on to something because as Indy is in the back of the car and he's forcing his hand down Willie's dress. Short round says, hey, Dr. Jones, no time for loving now. That leads me to think this isn't the first time Indy has done this or the first time that short round has had to tell him to stop. Listen, there's no denying that they are playing with fire in this movie, right? Like you take this little kid from China, you make him good at martial arts and you ask him to deliver all the punchlines in broken English. I'm talking about the character, not the actor, right? (laughs) Amazingly, though, it it, it, like worked. I felt kind of shitty for being like, yeah, short round, despite all the other issues I might have with this movie, is pretty rad. And then I thought about it. I'm like, oh, God. But after this, he was Data and Goonies. And then he made like some really awful action movies. Like this kid was pigeonholed from childhood. I feel awful about it. Yeah, but you know what? He did those two roles. If you're going to do two roles, make them kick ass, make them memorable. You know, just be Icarus, fly to the sun and just fucking crash. 
If by Icarus you mean Asian sidekick. <laughs> yes. Yeah, he's the Icarus of Asian sidekicks. But besides Dr. Jones not only being just maybe a shitty role model for a kid, he is a grave robber. They make accusations through this movie, through basically all of them, that he is a looter, that he's a grave robber. In here, we hear about the Sultan of Madagascar who wanted to cut off his penis because God only knows what Indiana Jones was doing. There was short ground in the background. But everything that he does is not what an archaeologist would do. He leaves every temple destroyed. He does everything he can to end up with the valuable item. And you look at what he's doing here with Lei Chow. He is doing this drug deal where he is giving the remains of the Chinese first emperor for that large diamond. You know Lei Chow is not putting that in a museum. That's sitting on his mantle in his house. And I think that's the part that bothers me about Indiana Jones in this movie, though, is he's converted from like, if you look at it, Raiders of the Lost Ark, he's kind of almost an ash. I apologize for using this term, but professorial in the sense that like he seems like there like there are scenes where he's at the university. There are these, at, you know, bow tie on. There's academic shit happening in this one. He's more like a James Bond. Like with the tuxedo and like, you know, it's a, you know, I almost expected him to like order his cocktail, you know, shaken, not stirred. I think it was an insult to the character. I mean, clearly Indiana Jones is a whiskey guy. I don't think he's a martini guy. But the one thing that I do think is great in this opening, I know, Gene, you didn't like the musical number, which fine, we can agree to disagree on. But I love a good prop. And the Lazy Susan at the start of this movie is a fantastic prop. You know, it builds this tension. It's ridiculous. And my brother and I, much to my parents and many waiters chagrin, would act out parts of the Temple of Doom at China Ruby, which is this Chinese restaurant in New Orleans that had a Lazy Susan. And we would put something on it like a fortune cookie or a chopstick and we would spin it and try to make it flip off like they do in this movie. And the Lazy Susan, I thought, still held up really, really well. This is just another example of your affluent childhood shining through because I never had the benefit of eating at a restaurant, Ash, with a Lazy Susan on it. And I was expecting something to happen with this Lazy Susan. It was like Chekhov's gun done all wrong. I'm like, okay, somewhere in the action sequence, there's going to be like somebody's going to slide a fucking knife off of this Lazy Susan. It's going to go shooting through somebody's (laughs) eye. No, all that happened was they passed drinks and diamonds around on it, which is about as bougie as I can imagine. And just for the record, China Ruby had a great family special that was like fifteen ninety nine for like super shitty Chinese food. So I don't know how affluent and bougie my childhood was at China Ruby, but I'll give you the Lazy Susan. That was pretty fucking cool. My sister and I used to have to split a slice of pizza. One oh of us would get god. the cheese and the oh, wow. other one would get the dough. Wow. Oh my god. Oh, Did you play with Grummy instead of Grimace too, Gene? <laughs> <laughs> Fuck yeah. Well, the group eventually (laughs) arrive at the village of Mayapur in northern India. The impoverished villagers mm -hmm, believe the three have been sent by Shiva to retrieve the sacred stone stolen from their shrine, as well as the community's missing children from evil forces in the nearby Pankot Palace. Indy agrees to go to Pankot to investigate. During the journey, he hypothesizes that the stone may be one of the five fabled Shankara Shivlings that promise fortune and glory. So once we hit the water, they come to a rest on the side and they're introduced to the local villagers. There is a stark contrast in the tone of the movie. It changes colors. It feels very different. The opening scene, the vibrant colors of Shanghai and of the musical number, which you so hate, and the, the references back to the film noir of the 40s. Uh, if this turns into a dark, almost like a horror film, the palette changes. It felt like a completely different movie. It went from goofy and fun and throwing flaming shish kebabs at, you know, the China Star Buffet to a very dark, horror, scary film quickly. China Ruby. Big D. But well, and I mean, I think that the the darkness is intentional. So Spielberg and Lucas both have talked at length about how they were going through a really dark period in their lives when they made this movie. Both were going through a divorce or were starting to go through a divorce. And they dealt with kind of this conundrum where they didn't want the Nazis to be the bad guy again, because they're the bad guy in Raiders. Spoiler alert, they're the bad guys in Last Crusade that we're going to review next week. And so they said, we've got to do something other than another fucking Nazi movie. And so that's where they ended up with with this. 
But this is where we get to that concept of punching up, right? I'm a big fan of the term punching up, which is if you've got to have a bad guy, they've got to be a bad guy that we agree is in a greater position of power than your hero, right? So you can punch up. Nazis are perfect to be bad guys because we all universally agree they suck. And we all universally agree that in the 30s, they kind of had the upper hand on, say, Indy. Because otherwise, what you end up with is a movie where white people are just interfering in other people's shit, right? And that that kind of creates this other tone in the movie, which is this entire white savior complex that is certainly going on here. And like, I get it that there's empowerment in the idea that the villagers prayed for a solution to their problem but then who shows up and fully believes that they are the answer to the prayers it's fucking indiana jones and the movie continues to hammer on this view of brown people being utterly inept they can't save themselves they also can't kill indy they got rifles and arrows and hatchets and spears and they just can't get this one plucky white guy because he's so fucking good with his whip uh, you see, I'm going to I wish I had the social justice warrior theme queued up. I don't. But mm-hmm. you could say the Nazis, they were equally inept. Indiana Jones had a whip and he's running around hundreds of them. So it's not just the brown people that can't kill him. But that's exactly why it's OK. If you've got people who are in, responsible for the Holocaust, you have people who are like overrunning <laughs> Europe and they're getting made fun of. I think that's OK when you have the poor like villagers of India, like even the thuggies, you got to imagine like they are they're underground, like they're hiding out. They are a religiously persecuted people. And who's there running the show? The British. Well, we're just checking up on you. And they end up looking like heroes in the end. I don't know. This did not sit well with me. Yeah. But back in 84, do you think this would have bothered you then? Or is this the 2020 gene looking back on it? Well, the purpose of this podcast is 2020, Gene. But also, yeah, as a brown kid, this would have bothered me back then, too. (laughs) One of the things that I found really distracting in this part was not the white saviorism as much as it was the dubbing issues. There is such terrible sound quality in this part of the movie. Like, if you watch, there's nine different times in this section where the audio doesn't match the mouth movement of the characters. And I've always considered Spielberg to kind of be like the height of directing, like this brilliant director, especially from the time period, like his golden age was the 80s, right? But the audio issues were so bad, y'all. And it made me go, wow, I'm really fucking old because this movie is really fucking old. Yeah. And it's kind of strange because this is 84. You figure that Return of the Jedi has already come out. You know, Spielberg is renowned for his special effects. ILM worked on this. And that plane crash into the side of the mountain looks like you had some some interns do it. It looks ridiculous. (laughs) And when they throw the bodies out of the airplane in that raft, you can see their dummies strapped down. It was really bad. And it was kind of surprising. But you know what? I don't care. I don't care. I knew it was dummies. I knew it wouldn't work. But I just didn't care. I cut them some slack. When they really did the little life raft thing, and that's what I liked about it, is like they could have done some shitty ass CGI, like throwing the life raft out where they're on a green screen. They're like, ah, you know, as they're like (laughs) flying down. But instead, they put some of the dummies on the life raft and they really videotaped it falling from the sky. And I'm sorry, I was sitting there and as cheesy as it is, and I know that it's ridiculous. I was like, yeah, that's fucking cool. Like Indy MacGyvered the shit out of this thing and they're all right. See, again, MacGyver, James Bond, like you're giving me shit in this. Like in Raiders, you had Indy doing things that were like he was more like Bruce Willis in Die Hard, right? It was like, a, oh, shit, you know, moments where he wasn't like a superhero. He was just a dude who sometimes got lucky. The raft idea, this would have killed everybody. Ooh, like, yeah. I mean, this is not even remotely plausible. The impact, there's no padding on the bottom of a raft. You hit that snow, you're dead. I want to remind you, Gene Lyons, that you love the movie Young Guns that threw Emilio Estevez out of a window in a trunk and he burst out and shot everybody in the culminating part of that movie. That is just as ridiculous of an idea as this one. You thought that was cool, so we can think this one is cool. And it was. It was badass and Indiana Jones is amazing. I totally agree. I agree with you. And just so you know, <laughs> Mythbusters tested it. It would not work. It does not work at all. <laughs> but but Ash, I want to take uh, I want to take issue with one of the things you said that this was a dark time for Spielberg. Oh, that motherfucker was married at the time. 
He comes in here. He sees a hot young Kate Capshaw. Spielberg's got a wife and kids. He was still married to Amy Irving. He said sparks flew on the set. He started cheating on his wife while filming this. Now, granted, he ended up marrying her and they've been together for however many years. But maybe if he was focused on making the movie instead of getting with Kate Capshaw, we wouldn't have had these issues with production. I mean, they have been married since 1991, which in Hollywood years is like eight lifetimes. So maybe Big D, he just found his true love on this movie. And that's why the film was so good is because he was so inspired by her. Yeah, I'm sure his kids are as equally forgiving as you are. <laughs> <laughs> well, the trio receives a warm welcome from the prime minister of Pankot Palace. The visitors are allowed to stay for the night as guests, during which they attend a lavish but stomach-turning banquet hosted by the young Maharaja Zalim Singh. The prime minister rebuffs Indy's questions about the villagers' claims and his theory that the ancient thuggy cult is responsible for their troubles. Later that night, Indy is attacked by an assassin. After Indy kills the assassin, he discovers a series of tunnels hidden behind a statue in Willie's room and sets out to explore them. The trio reaches an underground temple where the thuggies worship Kali with human sacrifice. Okay, so Gene, you already mentioned on the fact that you don't like the way they portrayed brown people. And I think if the movie was portraying the culture of India in a way that they portrayed it to be real, you could be offended. But this is an over-the-top caricature that they've created of the Indian people and of the thuggies and of the religion. People in India do not eat this food in the scene when we're having the banquet. India actually has the highest percentage of vegetarians in the world. So none of these dishes are prevalent in India and you wouldn't have them. You wouldn't eat monkey brains. You wouldn't eat live snakes or giant beetles or have eyeball soup. This is supposed to be just a, a representation. It's not a National Geographic's history of India. So we shouldn't take it as seriously as you are. Yeah, I wasn't particularly offended by the fact that they weren't actual Indian foods. Indian food actually is fucking delicious, first of all. Yes. But it was more that it was distracting because Harrison Ford is actually doing some pretty good acting in this scene. Like this intrigue between him and the prime minister and all this shit that's going on is you can't pay attention to it because every time somebody's saying a line, you know, you've got uh, Willie over there going like, oh, ew. And then there's a like, <laughs> snake surprise. You know, it's like it's not – there's times when shock factor can add to a scene. In this case, it was really distracting from the scene. Uh, but that's the Indiana Jones way. You mix some action with some comedy, whether it's Indy's getting choked while you have Willie in her room being like, you're not going to come get me. Okay. In the back and forth. So I accept it. But I want to know if you were forced to, you had to eat one of the foods served. What would it be? I mean, I hear eel is, is fucking delicious. I'd probably eat some eel, maybe. But uh, cuz I'm not eating I'm not eat, I'm not eating monkey brains because I I've eaten brains before and I just don't like the taste or the or the uh, consistency of it. And same with eyeballs. So I guess the problem is I've eaten most of these foods and I just don't like them. I think I at least like eel in my sushi, so I'd probably go with the eel. I think the easy answer is the, is the beetles. You scoop them out of the shell. That's probably like a pate. You put them on some crackers or something, you're good. The rest of them, there's no way I'm eating any of them. I mean, I would definitely eat the beetles because bugs bugs aren't that bad to eat. Uh, uh, you know, when I was a kid, I had nightmares about the scene when I was a kid, especially like the frozen monkey brains I thought was so horrifying. But growing up and becoming an adult, uh, I realized that bugs are actually a really great sustainable protein source. My sister-in-law actually has a company where they sell cricket protein powder and they sell different like cricket dishes and they're pretty good. I've had ants. I've had grasshopper. I've never had beetle, but I've had ants and grasshopper and they're actually pretty delicious. I feel bad about my aversion to eating insects because what's weird is like seafood. Like if you look at like a lobster or a crawfish or a shrimp, you're like, that pretty much looks like a bug. It's just underwater. And for some reason, I like the shit out of crawfish. I'll eat two, three pounds of crawfish at a time. But you confront with the beetle and there's no way that's happening. No, with all of my like posturing here saying like, oh, I've eaten bugs before. I can't stand a bug to be on my body. Like this is the way I am the most classically feminine is that I despise 
bugs. And this is not CGI. This is not fake bugs. Actually, in the scene where Kate Capshaw is in the tunnels covered in those bugs, she had 2,000 of them on her. And it seems like kind of my my worst nightmare. They actually had to drug her. So she was completely <laughs> sedated in order for her to make it through it. And, and I understand because I cannot imagine being covered in 2,000. And they were not like little bugs, like that one stick bug. I mean, that thing's like the size of my palm. I mean, it's It's disgusting. Yeah, that was one of the things in the military that you have to get over really quick. I remember we were laying out in a training exercise of sapper school and we're, we're setting up an ambush. And when I look down, there's ticks running like all over my arms. And we looked at each other, me and the guy next to me, and we're like, yeah, I normally would not want this to happen, but you got no choice. You just kind of get over it. But the bugs freaked out a lot of people. The violence freaked out a lot of people. The blood, the eating the monkeys, it freaked out a lot of parents. And at this point, I'm going to give a little shout on the movie's history lesson. Back at this time, there was only PG, R, X, G. That was it. You know, so where did this movie fit in? They released this as PG and parents freaked the fuck out. Their kids came out crying. The parents left the theater. So after this movie, two weeks later, came out Gremlins, another movie that all the trailers and everything, it misled parents to think, oh, this is kid friendly. This is going to be a fun look at little gizmo. (laughs) They don't imagine them beating an elderly woman to death or shooting a guy out of a second floor window on his chairlift. So the studios were actually forced to work with the MPAA to create what is today PG-13 as a result of these two movies. So this freaked a lot of people out. Although I do have some criticism of this movie, Big D, I will admit that the dark tone of it and some of the violence was great. I really enjoyed it. So that Kali Ma scene, like I had mentioned before, I'd never seen Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, but everybody knows this scene. I, in fact, had the Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom sticker book and so I was like, what's this all about? This guy looks scary. And then I realized, oh, he's pulling his heart out. Cool. But this was a classic scene. Kids, I know, went to this movie and probably shit their pants. And that red lighting on Amrish Puri, like, who is a fantastic actor. He's so fucking good. And, you know, you, you look at that, and you go, oh, OK, cool. Like, I get the appeal of this movie that they went there. You know, we talked about Maximum Overdrive. You're running kids over with a steamroller. Here you have a guy pulling someone's beating heart out while the guy is dropped into a flaming pit and then the heart catches fire in his hand. I'm like, cool. Like, I'm I'm here for this. When it still looked really good. Like, it still looked amazing when he yanks it out and then they do the close up and like it heals itself again. I mean, all of that still looked really. And when he's, oh my God, when he's holding the heart and it catches on fire when the guy falls on the lava. Like, I mean, this shit held up great for it to be, you know, almost 40 years ago. It's pretty good. And I think what makes it so dramatic is the sound and the music. When they start like chanting, om nam shira, om nam shira, om nam, and it gets faster and faster and it's like rhythmic and the guy is going down into the fire, it is scary. And Gene, I remember being in the theater and there were kids that were younger than I was who were visibly shaken. They did a wonderful bit of audio trickery too there as uh, he's drawing his hand down the sacrifice's chest and you start hearing the heart beating you're like "Uh oh i know where this is going (laughs) it's kind of it's it's fucking wonderful and as a persian i appreciate accurate chest hair and the chest hair looked so realistic on that uh, on the dummy it's really fantastic and another point i'd like to gush about is the sexual innuendo you know you talk about this movie may or may not have been for kids they kept upping the ante in the sexual tension between indy and willie in the palace and i was loving this scene as they're going back and forth they're just dropping the innuendo and i was like oh god how far are they going to take this and they're talking about him studying her as a scientist and she straight up says you're going to study what sort of cream i put on my face at night (laughs) i was like what yeah but this goes back again to short round and the creepy relationship they have when short round knows he's going in to get laid short round goes hey you got to tell me about it in the morning this is an 11 year old boy telling an adult dr jones hey i want to hear about this well the thuggies have enslaved the children to mine and fund their operations as indy tries to retrieve the stones he willie and shorty are captured Indy is forced to drink the blood of Kali, causing him to enter a trance-like state and mindlessly serve the thuggies. Willie is prepared for sacrifice, while Shorty is whipped and put to work in the mines alongside the children. 
Shorty breaks free and escapes back to the temple, where he burns Indy with a torch to bring him back to his senses. After fighting off the guards and defeating the prime minister, Indy stops Willie's cage and cranks it out of the pit just in time to save her from the lava. Indy retrieves the Shivaling, and the three return to the mines to free the children. Okay, so here's my biggest problem with the in-movie characters. Children are terrible miners. It's a terrible idea. <laughs> it's, it's, it's awful. I'm all for child labor in movies. It's okay. It can be effective, but they lack physical strength. You, you look at those little pickaxes and the hammers that they have. No wonder they haven't found the other two stones. Those are like little toy sets, you know? Why wouldn't you instead go after the parents, go after the father? Because if you come into a village and you steal all the kids, I don't give a shit if I'm a villager. We're, we're mounting up. We're getting pitchforks. We're going to go and raid and get those kids back. If you take the father's, they're more effective miners, and there's nobody come looking for the kids. I think the point was that the kids' innocence made them like susceptible to the blood of Kali, and the idea was to convert all of them. And like you see, like with Indy, like as an adult, you can kind of resist it. I don't know. The whole time I was chuckling to myself though, because I was like, maybe Kali asked for miners, and like <laughs> the thuggies misunderstood the command, and they're like, "Oh, you want us to get little kids?" <laughs> no, I'll motivate them. Hey, guys, fucking break rocks, or I'm going to kill your kids. Okay, I'm, I'm going to work. Yeah, I thought it was like a control thing, much like the blood of Kali was. I remember that this was the other part that like really scared the shit out of me when I was a kid. I think it's one of the darker parts of the film, like this whole idea of somebody being zombified and like being able to be taken away from you. And what's really interesting is how themes remain the same because our four-year-old was terrified by this too. He He's asked almost daily since we watch when we're drinking stuff. He's like, that's not the Kali blood because it scared him so badly. Like, I think we yeah, really- I wonder why. We, we really have scarred him from watching Indiana Jones, uh, yes. but, you know. <laughs> and the, the black blood, like chalice, like human skull thing, that looked oh. great. I really like that. Mm -hmm. But I started thinking about it and I was like, if you're trying to make a movie that's making a statement, if you're trying to make a movie that is powerful, wouldn't it have been more interesting to just have the kids grow up in this cult and then become human traffickers and slavers themselves? I, I really thought that it was kind of a, a cop out to be like, oh, it's this blood of Kali that makes them do that. On the other hand, though, the fact that they made it a religious war where you basically have the thuggies, you know, saying that we're pushing back against Christianity and, you know, all these other forces from the outside. I was like, OK, that gives them a sort of motivation that's beyond like we're just bad because it feels good, you know. Yeah, at least they had a plan. Yeah, and they, they certainly did, but I also don't understand why they didn't find better engineers for all of this, right? Because this is the thing that happens with sequels, right? They see what happened in the first movie, and they're like, okay, what worked? Snakes and booby traps. I'm like, okay, we're going to have lots of bugs and like bigger booby traps. But in this movie, you have like this slow-moving like Star Wars-style booby trap where it's like, eh, and then there's like a lever that you pull to make it <laughs> stop. And I'm just wondering like, why would any civilization have a slow moving booby trap? Why do you have the Kali pit, right? That doesn't make any sense. The The ritual is never consistent. Uh, sometimes we tear the hearts out of random dudes, but then other times we have full conversations with looters that are trying to steal our stones. There were several times kind of like uh, Seth Green and Austin Powers where I'm just like, why don't you just fucking kill them? Like, just fucking kill them. They're right there, you know, <laughs> just tear their fucking heart out. And then I don't understand how this fire pit works. So the first guy, he gets dipped in there and he catches fire and he's screaming. And everything's horrible. Now, you you know, you have Willie getting dropped into the fire pit. And I'm like, is it not hot? Because when she comes out, she's not scorched at all. She looks just she looks just fine. She'd be yeah. steamed. She'd be like a like a bag of adamame that you put in the microwave. She would have been just roasted. I mean, she does pass out from the heat because she's a lady. I mean, I <laughs> I think that, you know, yeah. I, I, I felt really badly for Willie here. Well, well, more for Kate Capshaw here because I think she looks so fantastic when she's in that white getup that they put her in to be sacrificed. Like, she looks like a good piece of sacrifice. Like, she really does. But I, I don't know. Well, that's a question. Did they have this sacrifice outfit just sitting there? Yeah. They're like, you know, we're going to need this one day. <laughs> <laughs> let's just let's just put this aside. I mean, she's not exactly a virgin, but you know, put the white on her. It looks good, right? And she does. She looks fantastic. But she's not a great actress. I mean, I think we have to 
I want to love this movie so much and I do, but I, I guess it's our, our job that we don't get paid for to be honest about the film. And, and if I'm being honest, I do think that she's significantly weaker than Harrison Ford. She's not at all on the caliber of actor as he is. And even like her passing out looks kind of, you know, ridiculous. And fuck Harrison Ford. She's not as good as Karen Allen. Like, this yeah. is a massive downgrade in lead lady. Karen Allen in Raiders of the Lost Ark is a boss, right? She, like, the first time we see her, she's, like, in a drinking match, right? She's running a fucking bar. <laughs> like, she is she is a counterpart to Indy. She is a, you know, and again, yes, there's the whole he had a relationship with her when she was, a you know, a child. And that's icky. And, and <laughs> Kasdan is responsible for that. And so, thankfully, he's out of the picture here. But, but then you get Willie. And she's really, I agree with you, Ash, she was dealt a shit character. Like, her job, essentially, was to never shut up and to complain a lot. And I'm not convinced that Indy actually likes her. I don't think he has a thing for her. I think she's a jungle lay. You know, in this podcast, I've talked about camping lays, where it's like, yeah, I wouldn't have sex with you in the civilized world, <laughs> but we're camping, so rock and roll. She's a jungle lay. Yeah, but every movie has that. Even the third one with The Last Crusade. He's banging the uh, the the Nazi. Don't give oh, it away. Spoiler. That's a big. Sorry. I've never spoiler. seen it. Thanks a lot, oh, Big D. That's no, a I'm huge s- part of the fuck. whole movie. I'm sorry. I, 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 uh, he literally just gave away the biggest twist in the film. Shut up. Just let it go. Oh, I didn't. I didn't know. <laughs> Well, before we paint Indiana Jones in a negative light, I want to point out that there was a great moment where the hero got to be a hero. And I found it very gratifying, right? Indy, a lot of times he seems underhanded. You know, Big D mentioned that he's basically a grave robber, that he's looting temples here. But he shows his true stripes when he says, no, we're not fucking leaving without those kids. And I felt like Indy saving those kids was triumphant. It was one of those Hollywood moments. You know, it's a movie poster moment where there's that backlit silhouette of Indiana Jones with the hat and the whip. And there's all that smoke. And he just stands up strong, powerful, resolute and tall against the slavers, against these child traffickers. And I had a, you know, I had a woo, fuck yeah, big D moment where I was like, hell yeah, Indy, let's go. Yeah, I'd like it when the Ewoks uprise against the Empire. It's the exact same thing. They're throwing rocks. They're hitting them with little hammers. This is exactly the same scene. It was a year before. <laughs> jump, jump. The trio escape from the temple in a mine cart. They're ambushed by Molo Ram and his henchmen on a rope bridge high above a crocodile-infested river. Indy cuts the bridge in half with a sword, leaving them to hang on for their lives. As Molo Ram and Indy struggle over the stones, Indy invokes the name of Shiva and proclaims Molo Ram to be a traitor in Hindi causing the shivaling to glow red hot. Molaram burns his hand trying to catch the last stone, causing him to lose his grip and fall from the bridge and be devoured by the crocodiles below. Indy catches the last shivaling safely. Indy, Willie, and Shorty return to Mayapur with the children and give the missing shivaling back to the villagers. So this part of the movie has the minecart scene, and that is such an iconic scene from all of the Indiana Jones movies. And what I found really interesting in doing research for the pod is that this was supposed to be a part of Raiders. They were going to do a scene where Marion and Indy put the Ark on a minecart and use it to get it away from the Nazis, but they didn't like it. They thought that it was kind of ridiculous, and I can't imagine it working there. It sounds ridiculous. But here, it really, really works. And I thought this scene still is so much fun in 2020 as much as it was in 84. Yeah. Think about how many times this has been ripped off, right? Any cartoon you've watched, any movie you've watched since this, there's always, if there is a mine, there will be a mine cart escape scene, right? And it was so imaginative. It was so fun. I think even Harry Potter took some like cues from this style of mine cart, right? Where it was like, it wasn't just a straight linear path. It was like a roller coaster. It was a roller coaster ride and I had so much fun watching it, even though it went on for like, I was like, okay, surely the mind track is going to end at some point. It went on for like, (laughs) like 20 minutes. And I don't know if this is because my age, because I'm older and I grew up in this time, but I think the practical effects, there is something that adds an authenticity to it. We know that this isn't real, but when it's in CGI, it just looks fake. Here, the fact that they took the time to actually build a full miniature scale track 
that they then put a little digital camera on and pushed it around the tracks to do these shots. And they made little stop motion caricatures along with a full size cart for some of the actors. It is not real. You can tell it's not real, but it adds to some of the character of the scenes. And I, and I don't know, do you guys, because you're younger than I am, growing up with more CGI films, do you look back on this and think it's bad or do you think it adds to the character? I mean, I, I think that practical always holds up better. And I mean, maybe not in, in the moment, but I think of something like, for example, like one of my favorite movies from the 80s, It, the the television miniseries, that, that show is so good until the end where they bring in CGI. And it just looks ridiculous, that spider at the end. And everything is practical up to that point. So I think not only is practical better, it just it makes the movies hold up great, which is why you can watch Jurassic Park in 2020 and enjoy it as much as you can enjoy, you know, any movie because it looks like it wasn't made in 93. It looks like it was made a lot later than that. But this mind chase ends and it connects to another one of the most memorable action sequences, I think, in all of 80s action movies. Right when they come out, the water shooting out, they're immediately transitioning into the rope bridge. And that scene where you have Indiana Jones, he's out there in the middle of this rope bridge, which was naturally terrifying on its own because you don't know if it's going to hold up. He has no option, but he lifts up the blade. He tells Short Round, hey, you know, in, in Mandarin or Cantonese, I don't know what it was. And he says, hold on, lady, we're going for a ride. He doesn't mind risking this child's life. But that scene, you show a picture of him with the blade up. Everybody knows it. The second half of the movie, you think it went too long, Gene? I think it's just a runaway train. I think it's great. Well, I mean, he's not risking his life as much as he's saving his life, right? Because if he doesn't chop the thing, like they're all going to die. And who doesn't love a great 80s action scene complete with crocodiles at the bottom? Like it's so cartoonish. Like the fact that there's even these chomping crocodiles at the bottom. It's kind of silly. It's kind of funny. But you, I mean, I was just smiling. Like my face kind of hurt when it was over because I was just smiling all throughout the scene because it's just, it's just fucking fun. Ash, you asked who doesn't love a great 80s action scene like this. Gene Lyons doesn't love a great oh 80s God. action scene like this. I was like, wait a minute. There needs to be a consequence for this action. Like, Indy needs to die here. This is what I thought was going to happen. Or this is what I thought should happen. Now that Big D has spoiled it, and I know that there's a third movie in which he fucks the Nazi. But I thought that he was going to chop the bridge and take them all down with him. And then you would get uh, Willie flying away on an airplane back to the States. And she's like, and that's the last I ever saw of Indiana Jones. What a shitty movie, Gene. I never knew what a hero he was, sacrificing himself. And then, like, there's a villager at the bottom of the river that finds a stone and is like, aha, we get to save ourselves. Because here's the deal, and I can't take credit for this. I'm not a physicist, but there is a there is a blog called Newton's Minions where they watch – movie scenes, particularly Indiana Jones scenes. And then they're like, what really would have happened here? So they did the raft scene. They also did the bridge scene. They said the force from that pendulum swing when he cuts the the bridge, there's a one in six chance that Indiana Jones would have been killed instantly from the impact with the rock wall. Definitely, 100%, he would have been knocked unconscious and just fallen to his death. Uh, and that that's how it should have happened. Yeah, but, but he wrapped his leg around that rope. <laughs> Well, I mean, what did you want? You wanted a close up of a crocodile like chomping on his hat, like, and that's how we all knew that he was dead. I mean, like, what yeah. a terrible Gene, you're so much more fun than this. I'm so disappointed in you. Maybe I was just exhausted because it, the escape scene went on for a half hour. Like, I, I stopped caring. I knew they were going to win because the bad guys are buffoons and it's Indiana Jones. So there's no suspense here, there's no intrigue. When I knew that they had the upper hand, I actually paused the movie and I went, how much more is there? 24 fucking minutes of them escaping. And then at the end, who are they saved by? Like Indian soldiers led by the British. Are we now cheering genocide? Where it's like the British led Indians killed the other Indians. Hooray. This is the slaying of an indigenous religious minority by English trained Indian troops. I am not on board. Yeah, but you got to love Molaram's uh, instincts to survive, right? He will throw off his own soldiers trying to knock him <laughs> off. He does everything that he can to make it out there. He even orders his own troops to fire at him. I got to respect his dedication. You know, in the end, it didn't work, but psh, he was dedicated to the cause. 
All I know is that all those people out there, and you know who you are, that have written one-star reviews about how I hate men and how social justice warrior I am, I expect apologies from all of you because of how much I love this movie and those one stars to be changed to five stars, especially our one person who's written five reviews for us over and over (laughs) again. And I expect for the one stars now to roll in for Gene Lyons being a fucking stick in the mud and not liking the most awesome of 80s films. It's, It's just so disappointing. I know. You know, if, if Indiana Jones had like this dark backstory, you know, where he was like an angsty teen and his father didn't understand him. And that's why he went into archaeology and he listened to edgy music. They had to share a pizza slice with his sister. Yeah. And he didn't have a machete. He had like he had like knives on his hands and he cut trees into animals and whimsical characters. Hey, hey, now you're getting into Edward Scissorhands territory. And that is a great fucking movie. And I'll never <laughs> forgive you, Big D, ever. Just remember this, Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom, it was the Shat the Movies podcast where the white people ganged up on the brown guy oh just to tell him how God. wrong he was about misrepresentation. Oh SJWs of the world, rise up! Five <laughs> yeah. stars for Gene! Uh, One stars. All right, guys, now is the time to put your wipes where your mouth is. Uh, it is time to give our Shat scores the scale is zero wipes to five wipes. Zero wipes is a perfect movie. It is a glowing shiveling at the height of its power, untainted and pure. And five wipes is an absolute disaster. It's getting your heart torn out while you burn in the pit of Kali. We'll start with you, Ash Schlafly. What is your score for Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom? So this movie obviously is more flawed than Raiders of the Lost Ark because Raiders of the Lost Ark is clearly a zero white film. But this movie is still amazing. I think that Indiana Jones is a classic. It's not just a classic for the 80s. It's a classic for all time. And Harrison Ford is an absolute dream. He is so deeply rooted in this role. And I loved watching him. I also thought the action is just to die for in this movie. I do think that, you know, we get into a little bit of territory with Willie's character of it being like, okay, like she's the silly blonde, like, you know, that kind of thing. But I will put on my glasses and say, okay, this is 1980s and explore it through those eyes, but it still bothered me. (laughs) So that is why it's not a zero wipe film for me. I think that Willie's bad acting and just the character in general, not being as good as Marion's character makes this movie for me be a 1.25 wipes, but I love the trilogy. I love this movie and I couldn't be any more fucking excited about doing the third one next week. All right. Hi, Marks from Ash Laffley. Big D, how about you? I think it's understood that this movie is generally accepted as the worst of the original trilogy. And I completely disagree with that. I think there was a courage for Spielberg to go this route. You have that PG big budget movie and you took a chance. You went dark. You went against what everybody thought it was going to be. And it was so big and so monumental that it changed the movie industry that they created a ratings category based on what they did. I think Harrison Ford is as charismatic as ever. Yeah, Willie doesn't you know stand up to Marion, but who cares? Short Round is a great addition. The action sequences I think hold up there with Raiders of the Lost Ark. It's as entertaining for me. I think it's just in a different way. And I love it. I would watch it again. It is fun. Turn off your brain. Don't be like Gene Lyons. Don't overanalyze everything. Seriously. Have a good day. Go out, smile. Woo, this movie's great. Instead of just tearing everything (laughs) apart that means something to people. This is a one white movie for me. Oh, he pulled the nostalgia card. Don't go ruining people's childhoods, Gene Lyons, what you're about to do. Yeah, I'm going to say it right now. Brace yourselves. I'm going to say the words that make people kick their cats off of couches, throw their beer at the wall, crash their car into a tree. (laughs) The mummy was better than Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom. Everything in this movie took four fucking ever to happen. I was like, okay, let's fucking go. And yes, there were some tight shots and wide shots that were movie poster quality. It was beautifully shot but my god i felt like this movie was made for the slow minds of the 1980s that had to have things spelled out for them moment by moment this is not a movie for a thoughtful person with a quick mind this is for slow minds you guys women minorities they were the joke instead of indie and nazis remember in raiders lost ark indie was the butt of jokes nazis were the butt of jokes they flipped it around now and they're like indians and women and children 
are the part of the joke. For me, I cannot say this is even an average movie. This is a below average movie. It should not have been made. And I'm so glad that in the third installment, we're going back to Nazis and maybe we can get back to form. So for me, <laughs> this is a three white movie. I just want to point out that you just called Big D and I someone with a slow mind well, and I'm not thoughtful people. So well, again, those one star reviews better not be for me this week. I better get a break. Ashley, at least we have a heart. You know, well, I mean, I don't have much of one, but I guess I have one where Indiana Jones is concerned. Well, I'm sure you can cry it out as your tears drop over your private lake and your lazy Susan. Yeah. And I'll eat my own piece of pizza and just be a bougie bitch. (laughs) Okay. Well, now if we take the average wipe score of 1.833 repeating, that now places Indiana Jones and the Temple of Doom alone in the 73 spot. It is slightly better than Tombstone and slightly worse than Heathers. Oh, it's worse than Heathers. Yeah. And to give you a historical perspective, Indiana Jones, we rated a zero white movie. So that's a perfect movie. Well, I don't hate, I'll be very honest, as much shit as I've given Gene, I don't hate this. I don't think it's a terrible spot for it to be. I do think that it's better than Tombstone. I think it's a better movie. And it's not Raiders. It's not a zero white film. I will ask this of you, Gene Lyons, and I'm asking it on the air, right? I will ask for you to just wipe your palate, cleanse your palate, drink your whiskey before you watch Last Crusade, because it really does return to more of the storytelling of the first one. So please don't judge Last Crusade. Give it a chance, because I think you're really going to like this one more than you like this one. Did you just ask a Middle Easterner to forget about the Crusades? Is that... Is that what you just said? No, I oh, asked wow. you to forget about this movie and turn your eye to the last of the Crusades, which is not your Crusades, which, see, we're already starting off on the wrong foot. So let's just call it <laughs> Indiana Jones 3 that you're yes. going to watch. And it has Sean Connery in it. How can you not fucking love Sean Connery? You know? James Bond. <laughs> yeah, I know who he is. <laughs> Bring, oh, you know, shit, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, now it's the time of the podcast where we get into our voicemail from the audience. Big D, what do you have for us this week? Uh, so this week we got a voicemail from one of our, let's just say, colorful characters, mm-hmm. uh, Flavor Dave. And uh, he wanted to share his thoughts with us. In a world ran by podcast, one man has one mission, one goal, one dream to shat on everyone. But there is an evil rising. <laughs> Good evening. This Christmas, witness what critics are calling the greatest spectacular experience of the year. He killed his best friend. B, no! Stole his co-host. Bye, <laughs> Now he's coming for him. Featuring the podcaster, journalist sensation, Jean Ebenezer Lyons. And introducing AVN award-winning bronze superstar, Dick D. Dickerson Richard Ebert. <laughs> in association with Shad Studios and produced by Flavor Day Productions. You think you saw it all? Think again. The Shad Off. Coming to a theater fucking never. <laughs> so for people who have joined us on Shappy Hour, uh, that is the one and only Flavor Dave, uh, who has been featured in so many... If you like that kind of voicemail, Shappy Hour is the place for you. Fridays at 9 Eastern on Twitch, and that's shatthemovies.com slash Twitch. Uh, Flavor Dave is a regular. He's also in our Discord. And Big D... Um, this guy, he calls in for Lovecraft Country. Uh, he calls in for the movies. Uh, and, and he's so, like, humble about it and kind of embarrassed about his own voicemails. Well, he'll send them in and then write us immediately and be like, oh, man, I feel like I really shouldn't have done that. That wasn't very good. They're great flavor, Dave. Well, it's funny that you said that because he did that in the voicemails where he left some first trials that <laughs> epically failed. So let's listen to one of those right now. You've got mail. Hello, set crew and... Set families of the set nation of all the set armies. Ashley, I'm horrified what happened to you in your childhood. <laughs> that is unacceptable. For them to destroy your, your music like that, I was unfortunately gifted differently. <laughs> My father was in prison, so there wasn't much that he had to say so in. So my mom was just like, oh, whatever. I just want to make you happy, David. So... <laughs> 15, I think I was, oh, god damn, I can't remember, 13 or 14, something like that. She, I have, oh, fuck. All right, scrap this. Don't, don't tear this shit. I got to fucking gather my thoughts. I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry. <laughs> I appreciate the sympathy. 
Flavor Dave. And I also appreciate now you've given me my outgoing tagline instead of stay the fuck at home. I think I should just go bye y'all because that was pretty fantastic. Yes. Thank you very much, Flavor Dave, for calling in. We appreciate it and uh, keep them coming. Uh, also, I want to give an update. We uh, played a voicemail a couple weeks ago from Tom C. from Texas. Uh, and Tom C. had mentioned that he wanted to add a category for Halloween. Uh, we told him to call back in. We said, hey, maybe we'll be able to hook you up. And Tom C., what we've decided to do is to give you an early Halloween present. Uh, the movie that you selected will be the movie that we're going to do for you. For this Halloween, it will be Halloween for the return of Michael Myers. Yes. So get ready for Halloween. That will be the movie we've chosen. And it is for you, Tom C. And we appreciate you being a member of the uh, Shack community. And Tom, you really gave us a Halloween gift, too, because this is a fucking great film. So thank you oh, so much, Tom C. All right. Well, before we get to Halloween for the return of Michael Myers, Big D, what movie do we have coming up next week? Okay, so Gene, if you want to, uh, if, you, if you want to pretend like you didn't know there was a third Indiana Jones again, um, you might want to turn your ears off. Uh, next week, we will be doing the story of the intrepid explorer Indiana Jones, where he sets out to rescue his father, a medievalist who has vanished while searching for the Holy Grail. Following clues in the old man's notebook, Indy arrives in Venice, where he enlists the help of a beautiful academic who is not a Nazi and he does not have sex with. But they are not the only ones who are on the trail. And some sinister old enemies soon come out of the woodwork. It was commissioned by Candace, Andy, and Indiana. So this was a big box office success. It made $474 million uh, in, in the U.S. alone, and it's going to be a good one. I think Gene will be a little happier with this one because uh, it takes him back to his roots. Takes him back to Nazis, which is apparently what Gene Lyons needs. Oh, he actually said, oh, thank goodness. Next week, we can go back to Nazis. Thank God for the Nazis. Somebody clip that so we can just play it. Thank God <laughs> yes. for the Nazis. Yeah, let's go back to them. No more brown people. <laughs> well, thank you, Candace, Andy, and Indiana for your commission. Thank you, George, for your commission and all the commissioners who have made these podcasts possible. That concludes this week's episode of Shat the Movies. Be sure to follow us on social media and share with a friend. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, and Instagram at Shat the Movies. You can email us, hosts at shatthemovies.com. If you would like to leave us a Flavor Dave quality voicemail, you can call us at 914-719-SHAT. Leave a message there. You can also support the podcast by shopping our Amazon affiliate link, completing a free anonymous survey to help attract advertisers, buying our merch, or by commissioning your own movie. Find all the information by visiting our website, shatthemovies.com. And thank you to all the people who have recently been buying merch from us. Uh, what I think what's been happening is people get drunk during the Shappy Hour on Friday night, uh, like Nick Cobbs, <laughs> and then start buying Shap merch. And so Gene Lyons sales have gone through the roof. Uh, and I think it's about time we had some Ash Lafley merch. Mm-hmm. Also, you can check out our sister podcast, Shat on TV, where we review TV series such as Lovecraft Country, Westworld, True Detective, Taboo, American Gods, Game of Thrones, and Watchmen. You can find all that information on our website, shatontv.com. Wherever our fine podcasts can be found, including iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and YouTube. Be sure to subscribe. And if you stop by iTunes, please leave a review. Five stars for Gene. That helps the podcast grow. On behalf of my co host Big D, Dick Ebert, Ash Schlafly, and the King B, I'm Gene Lyons. Be sure to join us next week for the following movie. We're about to complete a great quest. The Holy Grail, Dr. Jones. Oh, rats. Oh. This is it. Look, the shield is the second mark. We found it. Indiana Jones is on the quest of a lifetime. Oh, oh. But for some adventures, one Jones is not enough. Dad? Junior? Don't call me that, please. Follow me! I know the way! Ah! A race across three continents. And in this sort of race, there's no silver medal for finishing second. Hang on, Dad! We're going in! Into the homeland of the enemy. Nazis. I hate these guys. Our situation has not improved. It is search for the Holy Grail. How dare you kiss me? Are you crazy? Don't go between them! Go between them! Are you crazy? 
Where's my father? In the belly of that steel beast. Dad! Junior! You call this archaeology? The quest for the grail is not archaeology. It's a race against evil. Germany has declared war on the Jones boys. Those people are trying to kill us. I know, Dad! It's a new experience for me. Happens to me all the time. Indiana Jones and the Last Crusade. Have the adventure of your life. Keeping up with the Joneses.